Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. Uh, so the, the, the title of what we're going to talk about tonight is The Trouble with AI, It's Not What You Think. Okay, and you can see in your handout that I emphasize it's not what you think. Um, and, you know, I, when I originally did this, is it was under the title, because I had been asked to do so, you know, to talk about the question of AI and the human soul. All right, and so I kind of want to frame a little bit that way. Uh, so I'm qu quoting Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle defines the soul, he says, the soul is the first actualization of a natural body that has life potentially, okay? And so note, for Aristotle and kind of the tradition of philosophizing that I, I would hope to, you know, be able to like motivate a little bit, um, though there's, I'm not going to do much with Aristotle and what, what follows, but I want you to see is that when, when I say soul, I'm talking about a kind of life, okay? Uh, a way something is such that it's alive as the kind of thing it is, all right? And so if you ask me, you know, what is the relationship between uh, human soul and artificial intelligence, right? Well, I'm gonna refer that to, what is it to be alive as a human, okay? And, you know, what does that have to do with thinking? Well, because in my view, thinking is something that grows out of or extends from what it is to be alive as a human, okay? So what I want to do tonight is to talk about um, what we might have to say about the possibility of artificial intelligence um, by framing it with a question about what is it to be a human being, right? What it is to be a living thing that's a human being. Um, and what is it, more importantly, what is it to be a living thinking thing like we are, okay? And what I want to, uh, I guess, argue or suggest or motivate for you tonight is, as I put out in the handout here, right, leaving aside the transcendental uh, pretensions of abstract of rationality, I want to emphasize two other constitutive elements of distinctively human life, all right? Natality and mortality, okay? So I think what's most relevant for us in distinguishing human thinking from what something a machine might do is the fact that human thinking is subject to natality. It's something that has to have a birth, okay? And it's something that is mortal. It will die, okay? So what I wanna, wanna encourage you to do now is to think about the issue in terms of the distinctive kind of human dependence or kind of distinctive kind of dependence humans have on their birth. Okay, and the distinctive kind of limitation that we have in our death, all right? And I, wanna, I want you to come to see that that is what is gonna most distinguish what we do from anything a machine does, however smart the machine may be, okay? So what I want you to see is I'm not going to give you an argument to say that machine intelligence is impossible, okay? I'm not gonna do that tonight, all right? Uh, I'm not going to give you an argument to say that machines might become better than us at certain things, because in fact, they have, okay, right? Uh, I'm not going to say that machines might not better wield rationality than we have, or we will, we can. I'm just not up to that tonight, okay? What I want you to, to come to see is that whatever a machine is doing when a machine thinks, if they think, whatever a machine is doing, if it thinks, it's not the same thing that we're doing. Okay, so I'm not trying to rank order what's better or worse, what's superior, inferior, anything like that. I'm just trying to motivate the notion that um, even if you had legitimately intelligent machines, whatever would count for that, it would not be the same thing we're doing. Why? Because what we're doing is conditioned by natality, birth, and mortality, death. And there's no separating our thinking from those two conditions. Whereas I think we can separate machine thinking from those two conditions, right? And this is why, you know, in the title I say, it's not what you think. It's not 
the abstractive content of our thought or something like that that distinguishes our thinking from machines, right? Or that's not the only way to distinguish it, right? It's the fact that our thinking is always done with our birth and our background and our death and our foreground, okay? And that, that, in, that inextricably colors what it is for a human to think, okay? So let me make that case, all right? Uh, and I'm going to irresponsibly try to do too much on this. So here we go. Hold on. All right. So let's talk about natality first. All right. All right. What do I mean specifically by natality? And so on the handout. Um, natality for me is the coming to be in such a way that the time and place of the coming to be is, is intrinsic to the being of that which comes to be. Okay. Um, and I know that's a lot of like philosopher double talk, but here's what I have in mind, right? Whether your phone, your iPhone is made in China or in India has no bearing on its intrinsic character, right? Either way, it's the same Apple product, right? Okay. And like, and Apple is like thinking, you know, moving from China to India now because they can do the exact same thing there, right? Cheaper. <laughs> okay. Right. And, but they, they think they can guarantee the outcome no matter where they make it, as long as they make it under the right conditions, right? But I would say, you know, whether, whether you are reared in China or India will make a difference, right? For many things about you that are very important. It, it, would, it would make a difference for many things intrinsic to your personality. It would probably make a difference for many things that you would think, okay? And so I would say that's an aspect of say, human natality, where we come from, makes a difference. It colors, in a way, what we think, all right? And I'm going to give you some very specific reasons to think that's true, OK? Um, as I put it here in that third bu bullet point, human thinking has a natal status. That is, the locality of our origins is a necessary constituent of even the most abstract human thought. As Ludwig Wittgenstein, famous 20th century philosopher, puts it, understanding a concept is enabled by, quote, nature and by a particular training, a particular education, end quote. And our ability to say anything true at all is always limited by what Wittgenstein calls our form of life, okay? Uh, and what he means by that is a, something that has to be in our background, like a past that we inherit, okay? All right. Um, there's three aspects of natality that I think are very important for what uh, I'm up to here. All right. So the first one is this notion that emotional attachment is the vehicle of linguistic acquisition and sustained rational practice. Okay. And there's a lot of um, empirical backing for this. Okay. So we're learning, you know, in uh, various psychological disciplines that things like language acquisition only really properly happen in as much as it's done in the context of an emotional bond, okay? Uh, that, that we learn language, like we would learn it optimally from other humans that care about us and we care about them. And that, that attachment is, is increasingly seen as something that is not just accidental to the process. This is how humans actually begin to learn, right? There's also some evidence, uh, I think this is, this is more thin, right? But I think there's some evidence that our sustained practice as thinkers. So like not only do we, do we become thinkers by a kind of an emotional attachment originally, right, from our parents in, in acquiring a language and skill, basic skills, but it, there's some evidence to suggest that our continued sustenance of rational practice requires us to have attachment, that it requires us to be in communities, to have a sense of belonging to something or a sense of, of mutual care. It looks like, it, like human rationality operates optimally in those conditions, okay? So the idea here is our thinking only comes online in as much as it's born into certain contingent attachments, and it seems like it operates at least best when it's still in the context of those contingent attachments, okay? Um, first, I, I quote on the handout here from a, a philosopher, Charles Taylor, but he's summarizing the kind of the broad sweep of the literature on attachment and language acquisition. So let me read this from Taylor. The first and obvious fact is that children can only become speakers by being taught a language. 
That is, they have to pick up a language from a community or family which is taking care of them. It's members talking to each other and talking to them. Without this, the human capacity for language remains without effect. The children can't speak as we, as we see occasionally with feral children who have been brought up by animals. And moreover, they lack all capacities which go along with language, end quote. Okay, and I continue with a quote from Peter Hobson, who's a psychologist who actually studies autism. Quoting Hobson, if a child fails to experience interpersonal engagement, the elaborate circuitry of the brain proves to be about as useful as a computer hardware working with inadequate software. The computer can still do fancy things of a rather humdrum kind, but it cannot support creative symbolic thinking. Okay, end quote. So the idea here is, uh, one, we're natal literally in that we have to be born, okay. Uh, but two, we're natal in this sense, right? That our point of origin in the sense of the bonds that we're born into make a difference for our acquisition and ability to exercise thought. We have a kind of dependency on context, right? But there's, and so what you see is like, this is, it's a kind of vulnerability, okay? But it's a distinctive human vulnerability, right? We can, we can be wrecked by being failed to be taught to speak, right? Nothing else is like that, okay? All right, secondly, on natality, all right? Um, as I put it on the handout, human rationality operates only in a context of cooperation, conformity, and social trust. Okay. Um, some of you might have heard of, of Stanley Milgram's uh, famous experiments about obedience. Uh, it was in the 1950s he did this, where you know he he had people come in. You couldn't you could not for good reason do this today, right? But he had people come in. Uh, they were told that they're being part of an experiment, and uh, they were told, okay, there's someone in the next room. We're going to ask them quiz questions. If they get them wrong, you need to throw this switch and they get an electric shock, okay? And uh, so it was all a put on. There was no shock going on, right? Um, but the, the, the people being examined didn't know that, right? The long story short is it was amazingly easy to get people to shock other human beings, right? And the more they got wrong, the more the voltage got turned up and they would hear people screaming in the other room, okay? Uh, as they're, they, they think they're shocking them because this guy in the lab coat told me that was the right thing to do. Now, not everybody did it, but most people went pretty far and they were willing to shock other people, okay? And the inference people draw from what Milgram you know, found there, not necessarily Milgram, but is that humans have this really bad gear for conformity, okay? Like we tend to like trust authorities, right? Um, you know, such that we'll do what we're told, right? In this case, you know, we'll shock people. And he's doing this right after World War II. So he's like, yeah, we can also get people to, like load each other on trains and all these terrible things. It's actually surprisingly easy to get humans to do this, okay? Now, I think a question then comes up, is that tendency towards conformity, is that a feature or is that a bug? Is that a flaw of human nature or is that one of the strengths of human nature, okay? Clearly, Milgram demonstrated it can go very wrong, okay? But I want to talk about another experiment, okay? Um, this is not performed by a psychologist named Von Hippel, but Von Hippel cites it, okay? So, and I'll be referring to Von Hippel in a moment here. So in um, William Von Hippel's book, The Social Leap, he accounts what I'm told is a fairly common uh, experiment that, that has been done in behavioral psychology. And the way it works, if I hope I'm getting it right, is if you take a human child and a chimpanzee that are about on the same cognitive level, and we all had like our chimp stage, right? Okay, uh, so you take a very young human child and a mature chimpanzee, so they're about in the same cognitive stage. And you take a box, okay, it's transparent. No, pardon me, it's, uh, it's opaque, you can't see in the box. And you take a treat that they both would want, you put it in the box. And there's a, there's a number of holes in the top of the box, say five holes. And you go through the sequence you know, go through like a, a sequence of, of hitting the holes with a stick. And then when you get to the fifth hole in the sequence, click, the, it unlocks, you can open the box and get the treat. You do it several times, right? Hand the stick to the kid, the kid's going to do the sequence, right? Unlock the box, okay? 
Then you hand the stick to the chimp, the chimp will do the sequence, unlock the box. Okay, kind of what you'd expect. Now make the box transparent. So it's obvious where the lock is. Okay, do the same thing now. Go through the sequence several times. All right. Hand the stick to the chimp. Chimp will, boom, go to lock. I want my candy. Gets the lock. The kid does the sequence. Okay. Now, Von Hippel thinks this makes a lot of sense, right? Because humans, in order for us to get around in the world, right, we have to do very, very, very complicated social comp uh, cooperation, unlike any other animal, right? So there's not much compared to, like us at least, that other animals have to learn in order to like execute their survival strategy, right? They've got to grow. There might be some minimal learning, but it's mostly all there in their like bodily hardware. Whereas humans, we don't have much in terms of like actual physical survival strategy. We get by by thinking, but thinking in social contexts that require a high degree of, co of cooperation. So it makes sense that a human would come out of the womb tending towards trusting what they're told, right? Because we have to be able to be taught. Okay, so we have a disposition that if someone is using speech in our presence, especially someone older than us or in, in an authority position, we don't assume they're stupid. We assume they're smart and they have something to tell us, right? Why? Because we need a certain kind of social cohesion and conformity and cooperation to get by that's pretty distinctive. Not entirely distinctive, but it's pretty distinctive in the animal kingdom. Do you see the, you see the point there? Okay. Uh, as Von Hippel puts it, quote, if I understand that another person has knowledge that I don't have, then I also understand that this person might impart knowledge on me. This understanding prompts me to pay close attention to potential teachers and to imitate their actions even if I don't discern their purpose. Okay. So one of the reasons, as far as we know, we run the planet is not, it's not just because we're innovative innovative, go on our own, you know, inventors, partly, and maybe more so, it's because we actually are very, very, very good conformers and good cooperators. But that requires us to have a kind of trust, right, in the people around us, okay? Uh, the uh, comparative psychologist, a uh, guy named Tomasello, uh, argues that distinctively human linguistic thinking could not have come about without quote, a number of earlier ad adaptations for joint intentionality, that is joint goals, common conceptual ground, recursive inferences, etc., and that its eventual emergence was part of a larger process in which human activities were conventionalized and normatized, end quote, okay? Tomasello himself has done a lot of experimentation in this, and my favorite of his is, is he'll take uh, a human child, right, and you'll, you'll, you'll teach the human child that there's a game that we play where we each have a role that we do, and if we each play our role well, we both get a treat, okay? And then he can also, he's found he can teach a chimpanzee a similar thing, where if we each do our thing, right, uh, we, we, and we go through the steps, we'll get the treat, okay? But then when he varies it, and he said, has a, you know, you're playing with the human child, and then you quit in the middle of the game, right? Typically, the human child will get very, very angry with you, okay? All right, because they want the game to be completed with you. Whereas the chimpanzee is gonna just go ahead and grab that treat, right? Because for the chimp, it wasn't about us. It was about the treat. And for us, we have this different game. It can be about not the treat, but us together getting the treat. And once again, we because why does this make sense? Because humans, you know, what our real thing is, right? What, what our great advantage is that we're very good at organizing, organizing ourselves. We're very good at social rationality, all right? So, but note though, that then means for us to gain our rational faculties, to, to like really develop them, we are dependent on other individuals outside of ourselves that we can trust. We're, we're dependent that we are born into good authorities. We're dependent that we're born into authorities that are gonna lead us initially in the right direction and maybe we, we always need that context, right, to keep us on course, right? So once again, 
This is part of what I mean by natality. We have to come from somewhere, right? And that somewhere does represent a kind of vulnerability to human thinking, right? Because, you know, conformity can go wrong too, as more, more famously. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Third one, maybe the hardest one to like really get a get a grasp on, is human abstractive reason presupposes a background of bodily skills. Okay. Or as the uh, French phenomenologist put it, uh, Merleau Ponty puts it. Consciousness is not originally an I think, but rather an I can. Okay. Um, let me, I'll start with an example. Uh, Hubert Dreyfus, who we'll hear from quite a bit later on, Charles Taylor, who we've heard from already, uh, co-wrote a book where they, they give this example, and I think it's very effective. So let's suppose you're going to ask someone, you know, say a, a young person, to do something to gain like very, very abstract, like say quantitative information. Okay, so um, you know, I, I tell my son Cormac, go to the next room and like measure the angle on the painting hanging hanging on the wall. Okay. And come back with me like you know how many degrees off center it is or whatever, right? Well, off level it is. Now, I ask Cormac to do that, and it's gonna result in this sort of quantitative abstract piece of information, right? But no, in order for him to obtain that, there's literally dozens of implicit physical skills that he would have to have already on hand, ready to go without reflection. I mean, literally, I'm assuming he knows how to work a door, right? I'm assuming he knows when he gets to the next room, if there's a meeting going on in there, you don't just barge in, right? I'm assuming he knows how to work a level. I'm assuming all these things, okay? And the idea here is, this is, this is, this is something that's, always going on for us, like everything we do, right? It always presupposes dozens and dozens of basic, practical, very often tactile kinds of skills, okay? And like Cormac could not get to the abstract information if he hadn't first already had those skills, right? And nobody ever really sat him down and explained to him in an explicit, conceptually like well-organized way, here's how you work a doorknob. Here's what you do if there's someone already in the room. Here's what you do, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, we couldn't do that, right? There's always more going on. There's always contingencies that come up that we just know implicitly that we can deal with practically, okay? Um, another way I think of it is, look, if you, it is all of us, you know, or, or maybe that like all of us who aren't exceptionally gifted, right, had to first learn mathematics in, in my generation and maybe yours, right, with pencil and paper, right? It began with my fingertips. And when it gets tough, what am I going to go to? I'm going to go back to the pencil and the paper, okay? Or, you know, maybe some of you learn mathematics, like depending on what the curriculum was initially, right, by here's a pile of of white beads, here's a pile of red beads, compare the number in the pile, like move them around. It began with something tactile, right? And, and very, very few people are ever 100% free of that. You get stuck, right, in your massive proof, right, that you're doing, you're gonna fall back onto something you're probably gonna do with your hands, right? Or at least you're gonna have to see it in space and know how to orient yourself to it and all these things, okay? The idea here is, even the most abstract exercise of human reason presupposes that you're doing, dealing with an embodied animal, okay? Because we're never really over the embodied skills through which we initially learn these things, okay? And I'm not saying we can't think more than we can do with our bodies. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying though is our thinking is never really 100% free of those very, very basic animal level skills, okay? And those have to be in the background. So uh, as, I, as I, I put, I'm gonna quote Herbert Dreyfus here from the handout, quote, it is easiest to become aware of the body's role in taste and touch, uh, but seeing too is a skill that has to be learned. 
focusing, getting the right perspective, picking out certain details, all involve coordinated actions and anticipations, end quote. So here's Dreyfus's point, is, you know, you actually have to learn how to see things, okay? And there's, there's great, you know, examples of this is, you know, people who have never seen two-dimensional pictures, right, won't recognize, like, people that are close to them in the picture until they learn how to, like, do the process of focusing on something two-dimensional and interpret it in a three-dimensional way. It's a physical skill, okay? Um, and so, like, if you ask me to deal with any kind of information, right, even in an abstract conceptual way, I have to first get that information, and that's always going to fall back onto a bodily thing, right, a bodily skill. Even if I'm reading off the computer screen, I have to know how to position my body, right, with respect to that screen. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be inside the room. I have to implicitly know how to get at it, right? And I just don't think there's a really good example of something that humans think about that doesn't require us to get at it at some level through the use of our bodies. Okay, the, uh, to quote another uh, cognitive scientist, a guy named Thompson, quote, perceptual experience is not an inner event or state of the brain, but a skillful activity constituted in part by the perceiver's implicit practical knowledge of the way sensory stimulation varies with movement. And what it is to experience the world perceptually is to exercise one's bodily master or know-how of certain patterns of sensory motor dependence between one's sensing and moving body in the environment, end quote. And of course, if our thinking is always an outgrowth of our sensing, which I think we can make a case for that, then our thinking is always, at least remotely, tied to our ability to like get around, to, to move ourselves. Okay. So once again, I see this as a kind of natality because we would not think if we had not been taught implicitly by our social context how to use our bodies. We had to learn this. We had to be born into something here. Okay. So as I summarize this part of it on the handout, all this is to say that human rationality is consequent to our distinctive sort of natality. Quoting Thompson again, the subject has to be seen as having a life in all the rich senses of this word, as formed by its individual history as a living bodily subject of the experience of experience and as belonging to an inner sub subjective life world, end quote. So what I'm up to here is to say there is a particularity to our thinking that is distinctive to our natality. Human thought, because it is natal, is subject to variation and subject to limitation. It's not just off the shelf. There's no guarantee what human thought's going to be uh, in the way that there is a guarantee of any kind of technological product. It matters, it doesn't matter for the smartphone where it's made, right, okay? It doesn't even necessarily matter, like the skills that go into making it as long as you get components that do that work out of it, right? But it does matter for us, quote unquote, where we're made. Not necessarily ge geographically, but it can, right? But it matters in the context we're born into. And whether we like it or not, that context is going to flavor, right? It's gonna affect our thinking. Okay. All right. Mortality. All right. So what do I mean by mortality? Um, as I put a hand out on the back page now, demise, right? That is intrinsically connected to uh, natality, it should say that, pardon me. It, by mortality, I mean demise that is intrinsically connected to natality. Only born beings are dying beings in this sense. Okay. We can see the relation uh, between distinctively human cognition and distinctively human mortality through three interconnected levels of conditioning for our thinking. Relevance, giving a damn, and authenticity. Okay, so let's talk about relevance first. Um, so, okay, right now, if we just like limit ourselves to talking about this room, there are indefinitely, if not infinitely many uh, opportunities to say something semantically significant. And that's fancy for saying there are probably infinitely many things, statements that could be made truly about what's going on in this room right now. Okay. You know, uh, the cell phone is, you know, three centimeters 
right, right, from the pen, right? It's, you know, what, six half centimeters from the pen, right? 12 quarter centimeters to the pen. That could go, those would all be true statements that could go on to infinity, right? Uh, if I asked you how many objects are in this room, okay, you might, you know, count the chairs, right? Count the podium, count, count the table, maybe count the human beings in here. All right, great. But then you could have counted, I don't know, like the bacteria in the room, okay, right? They're here, okay. Uh, you could count, if we wanted to like really get into it, like maybe, the photons, but they're hard to count, right? Okay, but so if I even just said how many things are in the room, there's probably infinitely many different ways we could answer that question and manage to say something true, okay? But let's say, you know, your, uh, your, your boss says, hey, go in the next room and see, tell me how many things are there. And if you come back with like the photon count or the bacteria count, unless you're like an epidemiologist, they're gonna look at you like you're crazy. And you say, well, I said something true, but the point is you, you said something true, but it wasn't relevant, okay? And, and the point here is making sense isn't just making true statements, it's making true statements that are relevant to the context that we're in, okay? You, you see my point, right? And um, I mean, if you think of it, like, like this is a very complicated thing we're doing all the time, all the time. Right, uh, we're constantly entering into new situations and immediately getting the relevance frame that we're in. Right, we're picking it up from other people. Right, we're constantly doing this. All right, as once again Dreyfus puts it, um, most of what we experience must remain in the background so that something can be perceived in the foreground. Right, if I can't sort for relevance, right, then I really can't say something significant. So, what it is to like be able to like actually engage in rationality. First step is you've got to be able to winnow out what is relevant and most of what is going on is going to be irrelevant, right? So you're going to you're going to have to be able to take some take a chunk out of all the things that could be said, could be thought about, right? And narrow it. Okay. Um All right, now. Um I'm going to quote Dreyfus again from the handout. It has to do with the way man is at home in his world, has it comfortably wrapped around him, so to speak. Human beings are somehow already situated in such a way that they need in order to cope with things, uh, things as they are distributed around them. Uh, pardon me, I botched that. This system of relations which makes it possible to discover objects when they are needed in our home or our world. The human world is, is pre-structured in terms of human purposes and concerns in such a way that what counts as an object or is significant about an object is a function of or embodies that concern. This cannot be matched by a computer, which can deal only with universally defined context-free objects. In trying to simulate this field of concern, the programmer can only assign to the already determinate facts further determinate facts called values which only complicates uh, the retrieval problem for, for the machine. Okay, I want to soften when, when Dreyfus says a machine can't do this, all right? Uh, I think actually since he wrote that, there's been progress made on this, okay? But I, I just want you to see whether machines can sort for relevance with the same efficiency that we do. They don't yet, okay? But this is what's being worked on, right? And progress has been made. Whether machines do it to the same efficiency that we do, I want you to see that one, it's a necessary condition for our thinking that we sort for relevance, okay? And now I wanna like talk about, okay, well, what principle do we use to sort for relevance? Like what's the criterion that we use to decide what's relevant and not relevant in some situation, okay? And whether machines can sort for relevance, that's not my worry, you see my, my general theme here. My worry is do machines sort for relevance by the same criteria by which we do, okay? And that brings us to giving a damn. All right. John Hoglin, um, a very important philosopher and cognitive scientist who taught at the uh, University of Chicago until he died very untimely, was famous for saying this. Okay, quote, the trouble with artificial intelligence is that computers don't give a damn, end quote. Okay. Um, and I'm reading another quote by Hoglin that I think clears up what he means by that. 
A single speech act cannot be embarrassing, shameful, irresponsible, or foolish in isolation, but only as an event in the biography of a whole historical individual. The person whose personality it reflects and whose self-understanding it threatens only a, a being that cares about who it is uh, as some sort of enduring whole can care about guilt or folly, self-respect or achievement, life or death. And only such a being can read. This holism now, uh, not even apparently in the text, but manifestly in the reader, I call existential holism. It is essential, I submit, to understanding the meaning of any text in a familiar sense uh, th that it has meaning. Uh, so what does Hogman mean here is, so if I'm walking home and it's like Halloween and it's dark, all right, and I'm a little scared, all right, I'm going to notice things that I wouldn't have noticed if I weren't scared, right? My fear, that mood, right, that sorts for me. It's because I'm scared, right, that I'm going to notice you know, that maybe kind of off-putting guy in, this, in, in, in the clown suit across the street there, right? Okay, well, you can probably always miss him. But, right? but I'm like that rustle in the leaves I'm aware of that I wouldn't normally be aware of, right? It's, it's my fear, right? That mood, that's sorting for me there. That's what's bringing things to the fore for me, okay? Um, I'm gonna notice things about my wife that you're not because I think she's the greatest person in the world, right? Okay, you know what I mean? So like there's certain things that I'm gonna be aware of in her behavior, right? That are perfectly available to you, but that's not what's gonna to come to the fore for you. Why? Because my love is doing some sorting there. And it's all there to be seen, just that you wouldn't notice it if you didn't love her. Do you see, are you gonna do the same thing? If you're angry with someone, you notice all sorts of things. If you hate someone, you notice all sorts of things. And they're probably true, but you're focusing on that. It's relevant to you because you hate that person, okay? Do you see that, right? So for us, moods, in a way, sort the world, okay? And if you notice, like, all those things I mentioned, those moods, implicit in that is something I really care about, right? Like, why am I afraid walking home on Halloween? Because I'm fearful of my demise, ultimately, right? Okay, why am, I, why am I noticing all these great things about my wife? Because I care deeply about her, right? Or might, why might I worry, like, might, might, might I notice some of her flaws? Because I care deeply about her, right? So now it's that emotional commitment to something, right, that is letting us actually put something in the foreground and put other things in the background. That's how we do it, all right? Right? And this is what Hogwin means, is like the problem with computers, and when he means by a problem, it's not a flaw on theirs, but what's different about us is we sort by what we give a damn about, right? So like right now, if I just started talking about, you know, the number of bacteria in the table, that's all true. I'd be, I'd be making up, but so if I got lucky and said true things about the number of bacteria in the table, okay? Well, that's not what we're doing now, right? We're not, doing, we're not doing epidemiology, right? We're doing philosophy, okay? Well, presumably, the reason we're doing ep philosophy, not epidemiology, right? Don't raise your hands, is because we must care about philosophy in a way that at the moment we don't care about epidemiology, right? There's something committing us to this sorting rather than another one. You see my point, okay? And what, you know, in Hoglund, you know, calls it existential, right? Holism, all right? Uh, because ultimately, the big thing that's always forcing us to give a damn is the fact that we know we're going to die, right? Like what ultimately sorts our lives for us, right? The reason, right, the, 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 the reason that we are concerned about anything at all is because we're finite beings that have to make a go of it, right? That we have to make a go of it. Right? And so implicit in all of our sortings is the fact that we are under a kind of pressure because time is ultimately short. Okay, And I, I would ask you, like, what would it be like? What would it be like to be able to make sense of the world at all right? if you weren't mortal? I'm not saying it couldn't be made sense of, but what would it be like for 
you to make sense of the world if you weren't mortal? How would you decide ultimately what's going to matter, right? Unless there was some limitation to all this. There was some pressure that you were under to get it right because you've got a finite amount of time to do this, okay? So the way I would put it is, is I think we can make a case that we sort the world the way we do. Things are relevant to us in the way that they are, right? Uh, because we have the ultimate mood we all share is a sense that not only are we born, but because we're born, we're going to die. Okay. All right. Third aspect of mortality, what I'll call authenticity. All right. Um, as I put in the handout, we know our sorting is the product of our natality, which is itself something contingent. We don't have to be thrown into this particular way of making sense of things, both as individuals and as species. This awareness, self-consciousness, inevitably raises dark questions. Are we getting things right? What privileges the locality of our natality? Okay. Um, the way I put it is, is so you, you, have a, you have a doctor and um, Someone's going to start out in medicine mostly by keeping your mouth shut in med school, right? And I'm told, and 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 learn learn the material. Do it. You know, you're going to start out with conformity. You're going to start out trusting the authorities. Okay. I hope you do. Okay. All right. All right. And then you're going to take out the practice of medicine. Okay. If you care about this, and I don't think you can really do it. This is a case I'm making, unless you care about it at some level. Minimally, that's going to mean you're going to be try to be a really good doctor, okay? Uh, but also, I think if you really care about something, you won't allow it to be a sham either. So at some point, I think a physician should ask herself, but is medicine, as I've inherited it, is it even a good thing, right? Or is it something that shouldn't be or, or, or could be done better? Right, that at some point I think, you know, like a, an honest person will put the thing they do to a kind of question, because you'll admit, yeah, this I didn't pick this because this was the best. I picked this because it's what I got thrown into at some level. So I should ask, is it just what I got, or is it what's best? There's going to be this kind of self-critical question that event inevitably will come up because you know, of our natality, leaves us vulnerable to like simply what we inherit. Well, if that's true, then we should, we should always be willing to ask ourselves at some point, right? Okay, is what I inherited actually good? Okay. And like a physician might be aware, yeah, like, you know, medicine has gotten things very, very wrong in the past, right? You know, we used to like, you know, cut holes in the head to like vent the bad vapors, okay? Right now we've, we're, we beat that, we got over that, but there may be things that we're doing in medicine right now that are what? just wrong and like another generation will see that they're crazy right but that raises a dark question to you if you're a physician just using this example right maybe we're crazy then right maybe maybe my way of life i've inherited is subject to failure maybe it's mortal right maybe my way of sorting isn't the best way and it may come to an end and and the, now i'm just using medicine as a, it's an easy example but this may be true it may be a question you have to ask about any profession or, or any marriage or any religion, right? That it comes from a natality, right? At some point, I had to just take something up. And that means I'm not in complete control of what I got. So that means I should ask myself, is what I got, is it inevitable? And if it's not, I should ask, should it be done differently? But that's going to force you to always ask or at least be willing at some point in your life to ask very dark questions to face not just your physical demise, but like the demise of what you really care about, okay? And I think that's really what Hogwin is up to with giving a damn, all right? Um, you know, the way I'd put it is, okay, humans, because the way we sort is through care or concern and ultimately mortal care and concern, we're subject to sort of existential crisis, right? Like we can come to see maybe the whole thing's absurd, you know? Or maybe we wasted the whole thing, okay? And I, 
I don't know what it would mean for a machine to have an existential crisis. Okay. I don't even know what would count for that. All right. Um, and that's why I think ultimately our mortality, right, gives a kind of flavor to human thinking that I don't think you find, you'll ever find in any kind of machine. Okay. Or at least I don't know what would count for a test of that. Okay. All right. So as I put in the handout, uh, since we are natal and mortal beings, there is no guarantee that our thinking is off the shelf correct, like some technologically generated consumer item. This leads us to a special source of sort of anxiety, a sort of being onto death, the experience, which is the experience of our finitude, and that anxiety is the dignity and the burden of not being a machine. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.thomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.